Chapter 7 What is Limited Atonement? The glorious euphoria of Wednesday evening carried over through the rest of the week, and it was increased after I called Terry on Thursday to ask for a date on Friday evening. She accepted with enthusiasm, which encouraged me greatly. Friday evening was about the only time I could take her out, because I spent all day Saturday on the church field visiting and then Sunday was busy with two services. I didn't tell Todd about the Friday night date, because of a fear he would try to horn in and double date. I had to tell him, though, when he came by on Friday and wanted to borrow my car for his Friday night date. I refused him and then rejected his offer to double date, giving him the reason that I wanted us to spend some time by ourselves, getting to know each other rather than being thrown together in a crowd. Then he hit me for another $5 loan, even though he already owed me 20 He promised to pay the whole debt on Monday because he was preaching somewhere on Sunday, and he thought he would probably get a nice check, he said. Reluctantly, I handed him $5, and he chided, Maybe we'll see you Friday night! I thought to myself, oh, I hope not. Before the Friday night date, I had the next appointment with Dr. Sisk in the afternoon. He had warned me that the most difficult point of the Calvinist acrostic was the third one, limited atonement. As I made my way to his office for our time of discussion, I was not as confident on this point as I had been on the others. I really wondered at that time how anyone could believe in unlimited atonement, but then I thought perhaps my reaction against it was because I did not understand what the point really said. Well, it's limited atonement today, isn't it? Dr. Sisk said as he greeted me. Maybe you can help me on this subject, he added with a smile. Well, I began with a deep breath and a sigh of relief, which was more for the sake of getting me started than to do anything else. I will begin by noting that the doctrine of limited atonement states that the death of Christ had a particular design and purpose towards the elect, rather than just a general design and purpose towards all men. Am I correct? Yes, but what does that mean? asked Dr. Sisk. I think it means that the death of Christ guarantees the salvation of the elect. Since all men are totally depraved, and since God has chosen the people to be his own, God has also provided an atonement for them, which guarantees their salvation. Dr. Sisk winked, provingly. The Calvinist would say, I continued, that it is a matter of whether the death of Christ was to make salvation possible for all men, but guarantees the salvation of no men, the Arminian view, or whether the death of Christ was to make salvation actual as well as it guarantees the salvation of all the elect, Calvinist view. You have stated the Calvinist view correctly, Dr. Sisk offered. Now, how does this third point of limited atonement relate to the first two? Actually, it is the logical outflow of the first two, I replied. If man is totally depraved and cannot and does not come to God except on the basis of God's election and power, then the atonement must be for the elect only, or they would not be able to be saved either. On the other hand, if there is such a thing as election and some are not of the elect, then there would be neither purpose nor necessity for Christ to die for the non-elect. Calvinists would argue that if Christ died for all men in the same manner, and if Christ died for the non-elect, then there would be those in hell for whom Christ died. This the Calvinist will not accept. All of those for whom Christ died will be saved. The blood of Christ was not shed in vain for those who will be in hell, the Calvinist would argue. I stopped to come up for air. Dr. Sisk immediately plunged me under again. Oh, so the Calvinist would put a limitation on the power of the death of Christ? Dr. Sisk probed. I could tell he was playing with me to see if I had correctly understood limited atonement. I didn't fall for that trap. Calvinist would put a limitation on the design of the death of Christ. His death was for the elect in a unique way. The Calvinist would not put a limitation on the power of the death of Christ. Because Christ was an infinite person, his death has an infinite power. His death, had God so designed, could have atoned for the sins of all men. There is no limitation in the power of death of Christ. The limitation is in the design of the death of Christ as set forth by God's eternal decree of election. For this reason, 
To keep men from being confused, some Calvinists would speak of a particular atonement rather than a limited atonement. Dr. Sisk enjoyed seeing me squirm and sweat as I tried to verbalize a Calvinist position of atonement. He fired another question. Would you or could a Calvinist ever speak of death of Christ for the non-elect? I found Calvinists disagreeing here, I continued thoughtfully, grasping for recollection. Some of them speak of the death of Christ as being uh, sufficient for all men, even the non-elect. This would emphasize the unlimited power of the death of Christ, even as concerns the non-elect. Others, it seems, don't like that term, perhaps because of a fear that it might indicate a general atonement. All of those seem to like the term efficient to the elect, which would speak of the design of the death of Christ as being to the elect only. Sufficient for all, but efficient for the elect, was a statement I found used by many Calvinists but not all of them. Well, that's my next question for you, Dr. Sisk asked. I laughed and rejoined, Oh, so you want me to ask the questions now, as well as answer them? I knew this next question. What would I ask the Calvinist to explain as I faced objectively his view of limited atonement? I would ask the Calvinist the following questions, I declared. First, what about all the Bible verses like John 3.16, 2 Peter 3.9, etc.? which seem to indicate that Christ died for the sins of all the men of the world. Secondly, why does the death of Christ have to have a particular design? Why could not God have given it only a general design? And thirdly, where is a limited or particular atonement taught in the Bible? By this time, it was getting late, and we decided to meet again early next week to discuss irresistible grace. As I stepped out into the hall, I fearfully saw Dr. Bloom closing the door of his office. When he saw me, he insisted that I step inside for a few moments. He seemed much friendlier than he had previously, but I was still cautious. Perhaps it had dawned on him that I was not the enemy, but a searching student. Perhaps he had gained respect for me because I stood up to him. Perhaps he had heard I was meeting regularly with Dr. Sisk. Whatever the case, he gave me a list of books with page numbers and urged me to read those pages noted. I thanked him and assured him I would, and I left with him insisting that I get back in touch after I had read the material. I really wanted to see him again, not so much to discuss Calvinism with him, but to talk to him about his attitude towards Calvinism and Calvinists. I determined that the next visit would be on my terms, when I chose and only after I had thoroughly understood Calvinism, whether I agreed or disagreed with the Calvinist position or not. The date that evening went great. I found out we had a lot in common. Besides that, she was a spiritual girl who had committed her life to the Lord's service. She was willing to do with her life whatever the Lord wanted. She smiled when I asked her kiddingly what all that might include. And then she said, Oh, a missionary maybe, or a teacher, or maybe a church secretary. Then my heart almost stopped as she added, Who knows? Maybe I might even marry a preacher someday. <laughs>